All right, so in a heat exchanger, uh, you know, we just talked about internal flow, right? In internal flow where we're doing an energy balance on the fluid that's moving through some internal duct. Uh, in a heat exchanger, you have two of those things happening at the same time. So you have to think about um, both the hot fluid and the cold fluid and how they work together in, an, in a single energy balance. Let's go through just at the highest level first uh, on the full fluid level and do energy balances to come up with a couple of equations that we can use to describe heat transfer in a, in a heat exchanger. So in this uh, diagram, what do we have? We have two fluids. Uh, it's in a counterflow arrangement. I guess not drawn, drawn, but kind of implied is that you know, they're separated. So we have uh, hot fluid coming in here. We have cold fluid coming in here, counterflow. Um, normally what we're gonna specify about this problem would be what well, we know the temperature coming in, we probably know the mass flow rate of on the hot side, the mass flow rate on the cold side. We probably know the temperature coming in on the cold side. If this is maybe we're designing this heat exchanger for a specific situation, we know the inlet conditions, that's what we're designing it for. Um, what we don't know are the outlet uh, temperature, temperature here. We don't know the outlet temperature here. And we also don't know what's the, what's the heat transfer across this. I guess that we're already going the other way. What's my heat transfer from one fluid stream to the other? So we have, you know, we can go through and let's, let's just quickly do the energy balance here. So, um, so an energy balance on this full, the full thing that I've drawn the dotted line around, that's going to look like, well, what's coming in? I have M, oops. I have uh, M dot H coming in at uh, enthalpy. I H N. That's coming in. I also have coming in M dot C at I C N. And then leaving, I have uh, minus M dot H at I H out, minus M dot C at I C out, all equals zero. So we'll assume this is a steady state problem. Uh, we'll not try to get our PhDs by making this transient. So a steady state problem. Uh, if we furthermore assume that the fluid is incompressible, uh, then we can model it with C times temperature um, instead of just enthalpy. So, um, so C times temperature, so that's gonna be uh, like this, which would be M dot H times specific heat, CH. Uh, so now it's gonna be THN minus TH out, uh, that's gotta be equal to M dot C times specific heat C times TC out minus TC in. Okay, um, so that's just uh, converting from enthalpy to incompressible using specific heat. So I can say, you know, this side here and this side here, they both have to have the same heat transfer, right? This, this is essentially a heat transfer. We have a kilograms per second, just a specific heat, a joules per kilogram, Kelvin, and then we have Kelvin. So this ends up being uh, units of joules per second or watts. So this over here is actually my Q dot in units of watts. Well, that has to equal the same Q dot on the cold side. So both of the fluids have to be, uh, you know, <laughs> giving away or taking in the same amount of heat. It's a heat exchange. System. So we'll say, um, you know, those are both equal to Q dot. Uh, normally, actually, we also write this, this, this combination here, M dot C. Um, this is normally written as, say, C dot H or C dot C. That's the, uh, what's called the capacitance rate. So the capacitance rate is in units of units of uh, watts per Kelvin, watts per Kelvin. So the capacitance rate is a measure of how much heat uh, the fluid can absorb right? relative to the, the other flow. So for example, if I have M dot HCH and I have a really high specific heat capacity on the hot side, my capacitance rate there is gonna be a lot bigger than the capacitance rate on, on the cold side. And that's gonna apply the same Q is going to lead to a lower temperature rise in that fluid. So it's a way of, of 
capturing, say, like the, the thermal energy that the heat can, that the fluid can carry. Um, so we often write it this way, just one because it's an interesting physical idea, but also it's easier than writing two things all the time. Okay, so this is our, our high level energy balance. Um, if you look at this now, we have again we have uh, unknowns are T. We'll just do this in green. So what are our unknowns? We don't know uh, TH out. We don't know TC out, and we don't know Q out. But we have say two equations. We have the left hand side equals Q, and the right hand side equals Q. The two equations and three unknowns. That's not quite possible to solve. So we need to do a little bit more to figure out how to solve this. Um, so let's uh, talk about this idea of conductance. Conductance. All right, conductance is uh, a measure of the, essentially the, the heat transfer coefficient for this, for a given geometry. The heat transfer coefficient times the, the area for a given geometry. So its actual definition, we call it UA. Okay, so it's a single thing called UA. Um, UA is equal to uh, one over our total, our total being the total resistance from one fluid to the other fluid at any location. So if we calculate our, our total, our total is going to be something like our total is equal to, well, so if we're going from, say, the, the hot side to the cold side, what are all the thermal resistances that we have in series? We think through in series from the hot side to the cold side. Well, first we have a convection resistance, okay, our convection on the hot side. Then we have um, our conduction resistance, but actually before, so before we get to conduction, you can have a resistance uh, kind of like a contact resistance, but it's called a following resistance. So I think that as you're, as you're running these things, they're, they're normally designed to run you know, 30 years or whatever. Over time, there's gonna start to accumulate junk on the surface or impurities or whatever. And now you have to not just conduct across the wall, you have to conduct across that little film or whatever's been generated. Um, so just as a side over here, we have our, our following resistance. And that's defined as R sub F is normally given to us as R double prime F. Uh, and then we divide that by the surface area that's available for each transfer. So our double prime half is something that we can go look up in these usually. In fact, so let's do that quick. So if I look in my library here, uh, there's a drop down that says following factors right here. So I could go into this table. Unfortunately, it's not formatted very well, but I could say, okay, is my fluid water? My fluid's water and it's brackish water, city well water, river water, whatever. I can come in here and I can paste this thing in. Um, and it's going to return for me a, a small number. It's usually like you know, one e to the minus four or something like that. Um, but that's a, a following resistance that I can then use in my, in my equation here uh, to calculate my, my one side following resistance. So all that's to say that here we have to add in the following resistance RF on the, on the hot side. Okay, then I have to conduct energy across our conduction across the wall, whatever that is. Uh, and then on the other side, I might also have the following resistance RF on, this, on the cold side. And then I have our convection on the cold side as well. So when I'm calculating my total resistance, you know, from one fluid to the other, I have one, two, three, I have five resistances in series that I have to account for in order to get heat from one side to the other. So I can go through and just make that evaluation. You can just use the things we talked about for, uh, for, for thermal resistances. And then you end up with this R total, and then you can plug that in and you get this UA value, right? Your conductance. And the units on conductance are gonna be uh, what? Uh, Kelvin, uh, sorry, it's been intrigued this way. So units for conductance are going to be one over our total, which is going to be uh, watts per Kelvin. Get that right. Our total resistance is inverted. It's either that or the inverse, right? So, but you can think of it as um, 
You can think of it as the amount of heat that's needed uh, to raise the temperature of one degree. It's like kind of a relationship between the heat that's needed and the, and the, the temperature. Um, another way of thinking about this is actually where, where did UA come from originally? The UA is the kind of old fashioned way of saying heat transfer coefficient times area. So we don't actually have like a single convection heat transfer coefficient here. We have a total effective heat transfer, which we call U. So U kind of captures all the things in that resistance that aren't just the area. So you can actually break out, like if you know UA, you happen to know area as well. You could then infer from that what the total uh, heat transfer so the coefficient is for the whole resistance step. Um, right, so you know, making these evaluations is, is sometimes a little bit tricky. You have uh, you, you could use something like those compact heat exchanger correlations that kind of does the evaluation for you. Let's say you have a simpler uh, system. Uh, something that looks maybe like this, where you have a bank of tubes. You can use your correlations that we've uh, already talked about, your external flow or internal flow, as they're appropriate. But you'll see here that there's maybe not a clear, like if I was to use flow over a tube for this, a cylindrical tube, that might not be exactly right. Because while there could be boundary layers that are, if these are close enough, you could have boundary layers that are forming that um, interfere with each other that could become internal. So using a, one of those existing correlations is maybe not great. If you look at ease though, again, we'll look at ease. You can go in here in the, what, convection, uh, external flow, external flow here. If you actually flip through far enough, you should see a couple of, let's see this one, maybe it's just dimensional. Dimensional. You should see, yeah, you should see some arrangements that you can use for producing convection. So this is, you know, you give it the spacing, it's hard to see, but the spacing between them and the X and then the Y, you give it uh, two diameters and it'll actually calculate for you the external heat transfer coefficient when you solve one. But these, these exist as well in other tools you can use. Okay. Um, all right, so I think I went a little out of order here, but this was the compact heat exchanger, uh, uh, the Colburn table that I was telling you about. So you actually look and plot out the Colburn uh, friction factor and the, uh, the heat transfer um, number there, J. This is what it would actually look like for a specific geometry. And then the, the libraries and these will help you kind of decode these. Okay, so we have, I think, a couple minutes uh, where I'm going to get as far as I want to, but um, let's start with the, this process of resolving this outstanding issue that we have of three equations, or three unknowns, and two equations. We have a relationship for Q dot related to the hot flow and the cold flow. And we don't yet have enough information to pin down exactly what Q dot is. So we want to, I went on this, but it may be a diversion of telling you how to calculate total resistance. That's part of what you need to know. But we actually have, I need to, do go through and do a full energy balance on both the, the heat flows at a local level, at the control volume level, in order to come up with a relationship, relationship that we can use to solve for Q. Um, 